All right. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's Ammon here, living on land. And welcome, Tom. Good morning. Good morning, Ammon. How's it going? I'm, I'm good. It's been a little while. And thanks for uh, getting back, having a good conversation. So we're going to do a little bit different this time. Uh, I know Tom's probably burnt out talking about law the whole time. And uh, I'm definitely... I've been putting together a list of some health stuff, some natural, natural, I mean, because anybody that's not familiar, Tom is uh, a great teacher on health and living naturally and healing. So um, we're going to stick to that today. Uh, Tom, for anybody who is new to you on my channel, do you want to tell you, tell a little bit about your background in this and, and how you got started? Yeah, sure. I'm a holistic health practitioner is my background. I got started because I was always interested in health and the human body and the mind and the soul and how it all ties together. And I got really sick in my early to mid 20s. And uh, everything that I'd studied through science, had studied medicine, had done natural medicine, had done, you know, all that sort of stuff. Not only was it not helping, but the people who I was looking up to who were supposedly experts, they weren't helping either. They kind of all ran for the hills. So, uh, yeah, so I had to start figuring things out for myself and really looking into much deeper, um, you know, avenues. So places that weren't just the standard as far as information led me to a lot of different realizations. Um, one of my early mentors is Paul Check. Um, I learned a lot through him and through people that he'd studied, like uh, Rudolf Steiner and too many people list, but that's when I also found out a lot about germ theory versus terrain. And so I threw out everything that I thought that I knew about how microbes worked and viruses and everything like that. And then once Corona started, I put out a video called, uh, was a title, Can You Catch a Virus? And uh, it was, um, <laughs> it went around the world and that was, um, yeah, that's all. That's kind of like everything started from there. I'd actually moved out of that world of health and, uh, and uh, you know, holistic health and healing and things because it was just, I was finding that there was a big dissonance between where people were at, where they said, where they were saying they were and what they actually were willing to do. And so I just kind of moved out of it and I went into film and photography. And then, uh, yeah, the old coronavirus brought me back into the, uh, into the mix with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's what I've been doing since. Yeah. Um, I like definitely when, so something that I've learned that Tom does, and I don't want to speak for you, I want you to speak to this, but is that, uh, you know, what you did is basically started looking to nature and also looking into tribes and anyone who doesn't get sick, lives extremely healthy, you know, what do they do? And that's like, that's, it's this, it's simple. The world's not, the world's not complicated. And so I, I always like that about Tom's style and way of explaining things. So I just figured, you know, I thought of some unique questions because I, I, I watch all, all your videos or as many as I can. I don't know if I'd say I get every single one, but I want to, <laughs> I want to try and soak up, <laughs> want to try and soak up, the, soak up everything I can. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I've been thinking of some unique questions. So we just want to do that, jump into this health. Right. And I, and I encourage anybody, um, I don't know why it's not changing to my, I encourage anybody to, uh, who hasn't seen Tom's video to go check that out. I mean, it's awesome. And, and you were one of the first people to get like super censored, like, you know, all, all the platforms like, get, get this out of here. We can't have people questioning the germ theory. Oh my gosh. They like people talking about all the planted propaganda, you know, bio weapon yeah. and stuff like that. But anyway, so we'll, let's talk about some health stuff. I've been saving up, saving up some good questions. So cool. this is why I wanted to bring up that you studied, you know, tribes and anyone who doesn't get sick, anyone who lives naturally, what are they doing? And what are they doing is yeah. really just following nature, right? Yeah, well, it was Weston Price that opened my mind to that because he wrote Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration, which a lot of people are familiar with now. And that was back in like 1929. And he was a dentist that went and did that. He went and studied tribes. He did anthropological studies. And that's what was one of the first things that opened my eyes to, you know, all the stuff that I was being told just didn't add up. 
when I started looking at the natural way of things, it just not only made complete sense, but once I started to implement that, then that's when things started to turn around. Sweet. Yeah. Would you recommend reading some of his work or is there? Yeah, a, for a sure. More? Yeah. Okay, I found nice. the book. Look, honestly, with most things I read these, uh, the sum, the summaries of, I mean, I've read that book, but mm -hmm. whenever I've gone and read a book and then I've read something that's a summarization of it, I find that the summary pretty much nails everything. It's usually can break anything down into five key points. Everything else is just extrapolating on those points and getting to see it from a different perspective and then a different perspective and applied to a certain situation. But if all you're looking for is the key points and you're able and willing to apply those yourself, then you can kind of avoid reading entire books. But I would recommend reading it for sure if people are interested in what he got up to. Cool, cool. Okay, so first one, and I wanted to talk to Tom about feet. I haven't heard you talk about it um, really very much. And so I'll, I'll preface it with my own kind of story. And, you know, pretty much uh, my whole, you know, in my life, my own lifestyle, I'm always trying to move toward the more natural way of doing things. Because when you do things just work right, and you're, you feel great, and you're healthy. And I mean, because I've had back issues and knee issues and, and, and things, healing things by going to the more natural way. So I've been thinking about feet a lot lately because, you know, everybody talks about grounding, but with feet. So uh, here's my first question. So I've been wearing either moccasins or going barefoot a lot here, but I noticed that. Um, so with my feet specifically, I have an, I have a good arch. So when I put my foot down with my bare foot on onto the ground, my arch is lifted. But as my body weight goes onto it, my arch goes down and my ankle pronates in. And that doesn't feel natural to me. It feels like maybe. So my question to you is, should I try and keep my weight on the outside of my foot and keep that arch up? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's not supposed to collapse like that. If you watch your footprint in mud or, or sand or something, it should look like there's only a thin edge around the outside. If, you've, if you're a naturally high arched person, if you're a naturally flat footed person, you'll see a, a more of a full imprint in mud or sand. But for you, yeah, you can't let it pronate in because that's just going to lead to knee and hip issues as well. Okay, so as I'm doing that and, and being mindful of it, it, it feels weird to me to like flex my foot to like keep that from doing that so you think mm -hmm. it's a worthwhile to to keep doing that until it until i don't have to consciously think about it yeah yeah you've got to train it back in there's it's mm -hmm. usually a weakness through the um through the whole chain so you know it's not the foot's not just the foot it it has such a big relationship with everything else right up to the um well right up into the core so You've really just got to look at repatterning that that motion. And I had the same thing when I was a kid. I used to wear out the inside, the, the inner edge of my shoes a lot because I was pronating so much, but despite having high arches. So mm -hmm. I had to pretty much train that back into myself the right way to walk. Um, orthotics can have a place in that situation. I don't really recommend people go straight for aids like that but in some situations you know it can be helpful to have an insole and orthotic that helps you naturally regain that uh you know that particular you know aspect of keeping your foot in alignment nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that you can do it more naturally but you know it can take more <laughs> it just takes more effort you know to actually do that to to consciously work that hard on keeping your foot in the right placement in the right alignment yeah <laughs> Excuse me. So, we just threw out a fire. <coughs> yeah, we got um the neighbors just had baby goats and we we're burning off a whole bunch of stuff this morning just before sunrise. And uh, yeah, when I was lighting it though, I was just it's I was yeah, anyway, it was in the dark and stuff, didn't go well, inhaled a ton of smoke. So I'm still kind of like <laughs> there's still some sitting in the lungs. That's right. But uh, yeah, look, the um if you want to look at some really Gen, like general stuff I'm not going to say generic or basic because it's actually really good stuff but to use youtube as a resource can be a really helpful thing to see how you can do some exercises to help regain proper range of motion through foot ankle knee hip so paul check obviously has a ton of videos i always recommend paul's material 
Uh, there's a guy on YouTube who's pretty popular called Knees Over Toes Guy. He's got a lot of great material on how to properly realign or pretty much repattern the uh, the proper range of mo range of movement through a lot of things like basic walking. And a lot of this restricted range of motion up the chain through mm -hmm. hip, knee, and then into ankle, that can also have an effect on the way the foot will overpronate or uh, over supinate or whatever. It's just an imbalance there because it's usually a compensatory pattern. The other thing you can do though is literally just get a, like a thick rug or get, um, get some pencils or something and just squish your toes. When you, when you try to grab stuff with your toes and do that for like, you know, a good period of time until it gets tired, uh, that's the way, you know, the way, if this is your arch, mm -hmm. if you squish your toes like that, it actually pushes the arch up when you do that. So it can mm -hmm. help put some of that tone back in. It can cure things like plantar fasciitis and some Achilles problems as well. It's not a cure-all for everything. You know, everything's got to be done with the right intention and you've got to really get a program for yourself. I always believe it's not, you know, some people with generic issues, sure. You can get a lot from just watching videos. It's like, do this, this helps you know, plantar fascia or do this, this helps knee problems or do this, this helps, you know, with the alignment of the foot and it'll work for a lot of people, but not all people. And it's why it is important that you don't just use generic material uh, to try to, you know, handle a very specific problem. Because what if it's coming from somewhere that somebody hasn't properly diagnosed yet, uh, hasn't properly assessed. So, uh, you know, use what you've got. I think YouTube videos are amazing. They're great. There's some awesome people with some amazing content who are very, very proficient. It's just that you can't teach everything in a video. You can't assess somebody in a video. So take the exercises and use them. And if it's not working, you're going to have to find somebody like a, a high quality physical therapist that can actually assess and then, you know, help from there. Yeah. And I mean, I don't really have any, uh, like calling any problems, calling my attention to it. I have had that, but basically with my, you know, my thing, I have no, you know, emergencies, no fires going right now, but I, the, as I grow and, and move through this world, basically I'm just trying to get closer to where, to where I was because, I used to have those running shoes that, that keep your foot from your, your ankle from pronating in. And so that's like, you know, it, it felt better on my knees and my back and stuff, but you know, people in tribes, they didn't have that. Their, their feet worked the way they were meant to work. So my, yeah. my whole thing is as I'm going through this world, this realm I was trying to get closer to, you know, everything working the way it should work and just working. And, and feeling good and feeling great. So that's why, yeah, that's why I wanted to ask you about that and a, a good segue into that. And I was talking about like, I had the, the, the cushioned running shoes that keep your ankle from pronating in. And as I was, so I've got beautiful little trails by, by the house. So there's no one there just running, no shirt, no shoes, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, it just in the sun it feels amazing. But I noticed that jogging is terrible. Like there's no natural way to jog. I couldn't find a natural way to jog. And when I, cause when you're barefoot, you feel that impact of your foot just like coming down. Cause jogging, there's no, it's not a natural motion as far as I can tell. And so instead of jogging, I, I went to like all out sprinting, but it's like a, it's not like a sprint sprint racing sprint. It's just like a full stride. And it felt way better on my feet, neck, or knees, back, and everything. And it seemed the only thing holding me back was really the breathing. But, um, and that's, that's, I think that's what running is, really, is a breathing exercise. You've got to be able to control your breathing as you're, you know, exerting your body. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think about jogging? Talk about jogging or running. Well, running is very natural. Um, yeah. I, I get where you're going with that. I think if you're doing it well... See, the, one of the issues with the feet is if the feet aren't working properly, like yours aren't, you're going to have a lot of issues with uh, the vertical uh, compression, like actually absorbing pressure that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a glute, like a glute med, which is the, the... So, for example, can you do a full squat with your feet flat on the ground? Can you squat right down so your butt's basically against your... So your hamstrings are against your calves? Oh. Like you can... I don't know. I, I've never tried that, but I had my ACL replaced. So my, right. one of my knees a little tighter 
than the other yeah. one. Um, okay. But, yeah. So just to be clear, though, what I was talking about that didn't feel right is the jogging, which is like a heel toe, and you 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 slap yeah. your heel down, and running is going on the toes. Is that's yeah. how I was t- saying the difference between that? Yeah. No. I, yeah. I get where you're going. I'm <laughs> going to get to that. So uh, if you can sit in a full squat, like the way you watch Japanese people, they mostly squat and eat and squat and do things a lot. And that's how you're supposed to be able to uh, sit naturally through a range of motion and also not have your feet cave in. You should be able to keep like, keep Mm -hmm. your knees apart and keep your feet uh, neutral Mm -hmm. in that position. If you can't, then you've got issues through the, the hip, pretty much around the hip and glute area that is not allowing everything to sit in its proper uh, Mm -hmm. alignment plus range of motion, hip, knee and ankle range of motion. That'll all inhibit the foot, which means also that when you get that, that rebounding kind of pressure, it's a lot harder for that whole system to stabilize itself. Mm. And so you're gonna have some issues. So running on the heels is not actually that natural anyway. Most people that are good runners will forefoot strike, not heel strike. It is a, It does have quite a bit to do with genetics and your natural gait and your natural biomechanics and everything else. Some people, even elite runners do heel strike, but they mm. also don't have issues coming up with that most good runners will forefoot strike. So that's what you're finding. And slow running, even slow running, you would still actually rather not heel strike, even if you're just jogging. I find yeah. jogging to be something that's more of a um, modern day. I don't know if people jogged back in the day, you know, you would run, you would properly run or you would walk. I think jogging is one of those things that, you know, got invented in cities where you I jog agree. around the block and just jog on the spot or your traffic lights and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. It's a little, it's quite relaxing. Um, but, uh, you know, you see uh, like Muay Thai fighters, they'll jog and they'll be on their toes the entire time to get their, their uh, cars working hard. And it's, it's mm-hmm. a bit of a bit of cardio, but it's also like, you know, said it's a breathing exercise. It's a bit meditative. It is very good for the uh, nervous system, but um, doing it for a long period of time isn't good. And the body definitely prefers to get into its stride. So that means, like you said, going for more of an all-out pace for a shorter period of time. It's actually not natural for us to run for long periods for no real reason. Uh, Africans tend to be naturally good marathon runners. You see in the Olympics, they usually weigh ahead of other people in in a lot of the uh, medium to long distance races. Like they just stride mm. so cleanly, like it's like effortless. And they're used to running, at least we're told, I haven't studied it myself, but we're told that they're used to running long long distances across African plains. Don't know what to do though or what to get, but um, that's the story. Whereas in reality, if we're to run, we kind of need to get somewhere or we need to get away from something. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we needed, for example, let's say we needed to get to another town and the reason to get there was because we're out of food and water. I don't see the point in jogging there because you're going to burn through more calories and use up more water than it would take. Like getting there quicker is not going to help the situation. I would prefer to walk somewhere if I was out of food and water than I would prefer to run somewhere. Unless, I don't know, there was some laser gate that was going to close right on a certain hour. Then I'd be sprinting there to get there. You know, mm-hmm. But otherwise, it's kind of, uh, I don't see the point. However, I do see the point in needing to get to somewhere quickly to safety. And that's running. That's real mm. running. You know? yeah. That's going for more out or getting away from something that's chasing us um, or chasing someone down, you know, something like that, chasing some prey, something like that. That's, that's the reason for running for me. Yeah, I know. That's what, you know, those, the shorter bursts, that's why I was running through the woods and off trail. Uh, it's not even actually really trails there, but like, you know, you've got a boulder, you jump on this one and you run over there and it's kind of just, it's real, uh, uh, I don't know, variable, I guess, is you're not just running in a straight line on a flat plane. It's just, it's up and down stuff. You jump over this and you jump over that. And I mean, that's what you would have been doing anyways, if you were running for a reason through those woods, you'd be running from or after something really. Yeah. Unless you're like, uh, I don't know, the Lord of the Rings when they run after their buddy for like six days straight, they're running because they got to get there in time or something like that. But um, otherwise, no. So cool. Yes. Even the story, you know, um, the marathon race, 42 Ks, 42 and a half kilometers. 
the story is that that's the that's a Greek uh, is a Greek. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, yeah. but the guy had to run and he had to run to deliver a message to the other like whoever I don't know the story the king or whatever, and he had to get there and deliver the message. And then, and then he ran all the way back and then had a heart attack and died or whatever. But the whole point is like, that wasn't a natural thing to do. That was a slave's job. It's right. like, it's not normal to run. There was no need to do that except for somebody with money or whatever decided to send a slave off, you know, mm-hmm. whether it was a slave or not, I don't know. But the whole premise is that getting someone to go and do your bidding is not a natural thing. It's not natural to run a marathon. So yeah. I just, I'm yet to see in nature a reason to run long distance. Yeah. I mean, if you're living in harmony with things, you don't have an emergency where you got to hurry up and go tell somebody to do something or, you know, cause they were, I think that was about war, like get ready for war. If I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. it was either to marathon or from marathon. And it was, you know, having to do with Athens and war and invasion. It's like, get ready. That's They're right. coming around the corner. And that that's where you ran. I think he was yeah. warning about ships on the horizon from Persia. That's right. That's the one marathon. Right. Yep. So there's, but then, you know, you could ride a horse, you could ride a camel. Like most people had animals that they would also ride or some other way of not having to run 45 kilometers or a hundred. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about that too, the other day. And that like, you know, I just, we're getting ready to move and it's, a, it's two hours away and, you know, Pennsylvania is old country. I mean, people lived here for, you know, a long, long time. I was just thinking like, they wouldn't go for a day, right? They wouldn't try and hurry up and go for a couple of days. They'd go, they'd walk or ride a horse or, or get a, a, a one of those wagons or something. And they'd go for like three months to go somewhere that's 60 miles away. You wouldn't just go for, I mean, yeah, that would, that would kill you if you did that. So, yeah, that's right. That's what I mean. It's just, it's very, it's very rare that a, a natural situation would call for you to run a long distance. It's, uh, it's just quite rare. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, basically, as far as the biomechanics go, we're better suited to longer strides, which is putting a, a greater effort of uh, force to run, mm-hmm. to move, to actually glide more across the ground than to like bound up and down more. But that also has its place. Like I say, some people do it on purpose because it does strengthen uh, other structures of the body in order to be able to handle rebounding force like that. But as I say, they're not heel striking, they're forefoot striking. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so that, that was good. That was awesome uh, about feet. Uh, now, I have a, a friend and uh, I actually talked to her yesterday and she's just like, uh, so she's pregnant and knows that you know this western medicine is most you know pretty much not good she's being hounded by uh you know the doctors to do this test do that test and it's it's not good there's a lot of things going on there but she actually that she has a question and because the doctors just want to feed her medicine for it i figured it the perfect time to ask you this too so i'm just going to read the question if that is that okay I'll just read it straight from her. So she's pregnant. Um, She said, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes when I had my blood work done. The same time I concluded to be pregnant. The prenatal endocrinology team said that because my fasting glucose tests were over 95, that I had no other choice but to go on insulin. They said it is the only form of medicine to keep sugar level down without crossing the placenta. Now, the doctor said it wasn't possible to battle this during pregnancy with food and exercise. They said my hormones will be greater, which will raise my sugar levels. So I want to have more children after this pregnancy and, and I want what's best for the baby and for my own health. With a fasting sugar that's over 95 without taking insulin, what alternative choices might I have, you know, rather without taking insulin? Well, it's what the doctor said not to do, which is diet and exercise. (laughs) Yeah. That's what me and her boyfriend were saying. They've they've sort of got a, you know, it's funny when, when you started that question, I'm glad you said it was for a friend that was pregnant. Cause you know how people just go, Oh, I've got this friend. It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm asking for a friend and it's just like something embarrassing about you that you just go, yeah, this, this friend's got a question. Yeah. So (laughs) yeah, I guess guess you're not making it up if they're pregnant. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not my girlfriend either. It really is my friend. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But that's uh, what me and her boyfriend said. We're like, it's Tom's probably going to say something with food and that's probably right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's just there's their body isn't 
doesn't function that way. Like type two diabetes is a lifestyle issue. Type one's different. There's um there's autoimmunity and things in there, but type she only two has a- it when she's pregnant. By the way, she had it in her last pregnancy and didn't have it in between, and then has it again now. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's just it's an inability to regulate because of the see the pregnancies are a. Uh, it's pretty heavy on the body you know if the things don't go smoothly a lot can change in the hormones you can get all kinds of weird things that that last as well after pregnancies sometimes you know this like i wouldn't even call it type 2 i'd call it like pre-diabetic or something it's just an, it is a problem with insulin and with blood sugars uh or pregnancy diabetes whatever you want to call it but it's not mm-hmm. going to be ongoing and mm-hmm. so it does have a lot to do with what's with obviously the current environment but that doesn't mean that it can't be helped with things like diet and lifestyle. So when we're predisposed to this, it just means we've got to be a lot more diligent with what we do. And, uh, you know, the, the eating in that situation has to be a lot more dialed in. You know, with some, it's like somebody that's healthy. A lot of healthy people, they might get a lot of gut issues if they eat the slightest bit of gluten. Otherwise, they're healthy. Whereas other people can just, you know, eat bread and cakes and McDonald's all day long. And they don't get gut issues. So it's not just that, this is how you handle the gut or this is how diabetes works or anything like that. It's really the individual. And in that situation, you've just got to look at what your body is doing. And, and if if you're in that situation, then your body needs a very, very regimented uh, dietary Mm -hmm. protocol in order to keep what are essentially symptoms in check. And if you go outside of those, then sure, you might be having blood sugar handling issues. I don't find that insulin is really that necessary uh, 99.9% of cases. Sure. There's always that tiny percentage of people who will benefit from the pharmaceutical industry. Like it is there for, it does have a place. I'm not like a hundred percent against it. I'm just 99% against it. <laughs> yeah. So in her situation, I would imagine that if she did just get to eating a lot more, like literally just pure natural organic foods, nothing else. And most of that probably raw as well. She's going to have way better blood sugar handling and insulin, uh, you know, characteristics. And then the, the exercise has to be there as well. There has to be, and it has to be balanced. So most people would know that the better way to regulate blood sugar and uh, insulin and your adrenaline, your cortisol and everything else is through uh, weight bearing exercises, not going for jogging, not going for long steady state cardio, but going for higher intensity, shorter duration, and having more of that anabolic effect from the exercise, which is things like weightlifting, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, you know, professional weightlifting, like Olympic lifting, but just weight bearing <laughs> exercise. Right. And so uh, if you can do that, but also balance it out, which is the key part, balancing it out with working in, which is why I recommend going and checking out Paul Check's material again and looking at his videos, one in particular called the working in breathing squat, Working in just being the complementary opposite to working out. Working out, you're expending energy. Working in, you're cultivating energy. It's it's stilling the mind and the body. So basically the nervous system and the spirit together mm-hmm. through the breath. So you're sinking movement and breath and you're getting the nervous system into its parasympathetic state, which is where a lot of rest, digest, repair and growth will happen. The opposite being the sympathetic, which is your fight, flight and things aren't really repairing and things or anything in that situation. So it's, it's all those things, you know, you've got to balance everything out. The diet in that situation would have to be very, very spot on. And then the exercise side of things needs to be going for that anabolic type of working out coupled with working in to rebalance and restore the body and the nervous system so that we can function a lot better. Mm -hmm. Then if you did all of that, and you were still having issues with glucose, then, hey, perhaps insulin is necessary just during pregnancy uh, for that time. But I would bet against that being the case. Yeah, um, that's all great stuff. So as far as diet goes for her, uh, should she have more fats or, or just like the raw, organic, just clean foods itself, nothing you know, just kind of balance, you know, vegetables, um, or should she focus more on a certain type of food with that blood sugar problem, like fats? Mm, well, see, that's, it's individual. You can't really say just because somebody has 
blood sugar handling issues that they should go more fat or keto or high because some people do well on high fruits yeah it actually doesn't mess with their um their metabolism it's their metabolic type it's like what is their body like what's their body type um what's their natural state in their metabolism and then also if they're in disrepair are they out of their natural state of metabolism which will generally require pretty much the opposite so if somebody would normally regulate sugar as well with more of a high carbohydrate diet then they might need a much higher fat protein diet okay so it's just kind of and vice versa yeah but i would recommend look you can you can't really go wrong with paul check's material especially if you got how to eat move and be healthy and then if you read um probably Ogenus von der Planet's book, uh, We Want to Live. Hmm. I think you get a, a really good understanding of uh, the way the raw foods and, and you know, definitely going a lot further away from carbohydrate can work, but without going too extreme. I have seen people do really well on just a pure carnivore diet in that situation as well. But to me, it's like really extreme. It's not something that's suitable long-term, right. but you know, pregnancy is also not long-term. So maybe it's something you did just during pregnancy. However, I would think personally, if that was my patient, I wouldn't put him on a carnivore diet because I think you're not getting enough all around nutrients, especially mm-hmm. to handle a pregnancy. I would, uh, the diet that Ogenus von der Planets kind of, it's his primal diet that he, he kind of went with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's suitable for pregnancy. And I think Paul checks um, his methods are suitable for pregnancy. Anything too extreme, raw vegan, full carnivore, I think is too extreme for pregnancies okay yeah no that's perfect that's some good stuff for her to take a look at afterwards i was also thinking um you did a clip about uh for vegetarians and talking about metabolism is that still the same kind of uh self-evaluation uh yeah yeah but when you've actually got blood sugar issues then it's slightly different again that's what i mean it's like you can't really just prescribe a one size fits all for because when you've got something else thrown into the mix i think it just totally changes things so I would go more for Polchek and Ogenus, uh in there, like getting an understanding of what they talk about and why, yeah. and then uh, adapting that to yourself. Cool. All right. I'll send that over to her. I'm sure she said, thank you. She's very grateful, by the way. So um, cool. that, that's awesome. Um, so one of the, uh, oh yeah. So while we're speaking about food, so spicy food, um, I know a lot of cultures eat it. Um, and have been eating it and a lot of cultures can't stand it at all and for me I really love spicy food like habaneros I don't like serrano like dry spice I like the really flavorful spicy food and Mm -hmm. and and I crave it and you know I think you know for sure everything that you your body is telling you you need I mean it's telling you for a reason and sometimes like with sugar it's craving sugar because it's addicted to sugar. And I don't really think that I'm addicted to spicy, but I do crave it for some reason. So is there any, you know, what have you found in your studies that uh, points to people using spicy foods for reasons or is it a, is it a bad thing? So it's not a bad thing. People crave it and people use it for different reasons. A lot of people that use them heavily also don't crave them and other people crave them. And and there's a lot of different uh, aspects to it. So first of all, with using them, traditionally, a lot of cultures will use them because they are anti-parasitic in a lot of cases. They can, um, they essentially it's bug related, (laughs) fungus, bacteria, parasites, that sort of thing. It's usually related to that. People who crave it will probably have some kind of imbalance there in the body with regards to microbiota. Uh, they, it can be inflammatory. It can also be anti-inflammatory. It just depends on the situation, the type of spice, uh, how natural a form it is and then what's going on in the body. Hmm. There's, um, it can regulate heat in different ways. Like people in very hot climates tend to eat really spicy foods, India, Sri Lanka, Bali, like all through that, that equatorial region of Asian kind of, or Eastern countries, they have very spice rich foods. Uh, it's also got to do with uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, I know that the particular combination of spices that they use is because you get a certain scent from the skin and mosquitoes don't like it. Or they don't have air guard and stuff. So mm. they eat a certain way in order to keep mosquitoes off them because that's what's emanating through their pores. That's part of the reason. Uh, it's, it depends on how you combine them as yeah. well. Uh, there's a lot to it, but you would probably be craving it 
because of a yang imbalance in the body, which is probably like a liver imbalance. Can't say without assessing mm -hmm. it, but generally it could be something like that. Now, heat is yang if you think, and cooling is yin if you think about just the natural masculine feminine nature of things. And when you have an imbalance in the body, it's creating too much heat, for example, or vice versa. You might have, it's either a yang, uh, you've got, you got an overabundance of it or an insufficiency of yin, for example, mm. then you might have this craving for uh, spicy foods. Now, you can kind of dial that in if you say, well, how much of it is that yin yang imbalance and how much of it has got to do with my microbiota? Well, the answer to that is, are you craving anything hot or is it, are you okay with things that are just purely natural? For example, a natural organic um, habanero uh, pepper or something compared to like a spicy, like a super spicy pizza or a super spicy, uh, what's that meat stuff that you, it's like meat, but it's not meat. It's like a deli meat sort of a thing. Uh, like pepperoni or salami or yeah, something. Yeah, salami, like salami, things like yeah. that. Anything that's like salami. really. <laughs> yeah, so that's the difference. Is like, do you just crave anything spicy or are you only craving something that is actually purely organic and natural? That's another way to dial that in because I know a lot of people with these issues that just crave anything spicy. Yeah, you know? no, it's not like that for me. I like the. I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's still like, I'm sure that they're, they're not the best practices in making the hot sauces, but it, like good hot sauces, not like Tabasco, you know, something mass produced, but I like, you know, it's got mm -hmm. the carrot puree, it's got the vinegar and it's got the, the habanero, I mean, and onion, like those are like the main four ingredients and it's just mm -hmm. spicy, but it tastes good. And it's not just anything. It's those kinds of things. I mean, I do yeah. like, I'll, I'll love cooking with actual peppers and stuff too, but I, I really only do that if I'm cooking. I mean, eating one is just kind of like torture for yourself. I mean, it doesn't really do. Yeah. Much. Eating just <laughs> ow, that hurts. Like. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's it's got to do with uh, mucus as well because it can thin mucus. Like, there's a lot of different aspects to it. So, uh, you know, but I feel like that's it helps much clean it. you out too. Like in more yes. ways than one, if you get what I mean. But yeah, you get a little bit of mucus, and it feels like. And then like refreshing after the mucus goes away and everything. So mm -hmm. yeah, yep. maybe uh, yeah. be me clearing out talk, you know, modern day toxins and stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, the mucus is there to help surround things and which are foreign to the body. And there's usually a bit of bacteria in there as well. So it's kind of, it is a way to clean things out. Um, like I say, the spices actually thin that. Sometimes we get too thick in the mucus and then the, the spices actually thin it out and helps us to feel, like you said, a bit of relief. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, lots in it, but it's mm -hmm. got usually those two things are the, the core factors as to why you have an imbalance or why you have a microbiota imbalance. Like, you know, your yin yang, too much heat or lack of it in the body or uh, the microbiota imbalance why that's there is a totally different story but mm. those are usually the two kind of elements that for me in my experience lead to people having a craving for particular foods and spices included mm. yeah and it, it definitely doesn't keep the mosquitoes away mosquitoes usually like me but I, I, <laughs> I don't know I don't know if I've ever been bitten by a tick and and my girlfriend get you know finds ticks all the time but I've never so maybe ticks don't like it I don't know that's our blood in general you know some people are just mosquito magnets and other people are tick magnets and stuff it's literally just our biochemistry that's floating around in our blood but it's not just spice so in sri lanka for example it's not just spice it's a particular combination of uh of the spices that go into their curries and mm. it's that particular combination that the uh the mosquitoes don't like as opposed to just spice in general We'll have to look that up and make this particular combination. See if it works on American yeah, mosquitoes. But it's also, it's also <laughs> their blood, their specific True. blood. You know, it yeah. works for their blood with their their um their species of mosquitoes. It might not be the same where you live with your blood. It's different, you know. It's uh, yeah, you got to really dial that stuff in. It doesn't have a complete crossover to other cultures and other parts of the world. Yeah, I mean Tiffany is good at making the you know herbal sprays that keep the mosquitoes and ticks away i can't i don't know what's in it but she has one i mean it's just all just plants you know in in liquid but and that's she's fine-tuned it for the bugs around here so you know i know exactly what you mean it's 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 more than just one thing 
Um, cool. Well, that, that was my spicy food bit. Um, and speaking of liver though, too, uh, that is actually one of the other questions. So I, uh, had my first like completely raw local organic, you know, cow's liver the other day. And I mean, nice. felt good to eat. I mean, it was good. Uh, the only thing is, and, and I wanted to ask you about this. So unfortunately, no matter who you find local farms, farmers, they don't, you know, all they do is grass fed and he gives them some molasses in the winter. Um, there's no antibiotics, no nothing. It's amazing. He treats them really well. He's, you know, under he's 20 at a time. Uh, but unfortunately, and you, I can get Buffalo around here too, but unfortunately the custom is everybody flash freezes it immediately. So like, it's impossible to get it fresh, like fresh, fresh. So what I did then is I kind of, I, I let it defrost and I put it in the sun for not, a, not very long. I mean, just a few minutes to where whatever's alive there could come back to life. Um, but other than that, like, so my issue is so what, what's, how bad is having frozen meat, even though it is, you know, the fresh local stuff, unfortunately it's frozen. So what do you think about that? Mm. Um, it depends. My general answer is I would never eat frozen meat. That's raw. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, hmm. it depends on the flash frozen there. The thing that's the thing that I, the caveat to that is that if you are in, I don't know, the North, North of America or Canada or like Alaska or something like that. And you're taking down game, for example, or you come across game that's dead. Mm -hmm. And it's like the middle of winter and it's like minus 20 or something, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, it, there's going to be elements of it. That's like, it is flash freezing the meat kind of yeah. the difference is though, that, uh, the, it should still retain its body heat. It, sh it should be at, like, I'm talking degrees centigrade here. So like 37, but what's that? One Oh 98, six or something. Yeah. It's like, it's, uh, it's, gonna drop so if you take that game or you find it and you dig into it and you can still feel it might not be totally warm but it hasn't like got frostbite it's not frozen over mm -hmm. then you know you, it's it's just too hard to say if they take the liver out of the animal and they flash freeze the liver by itself i'd imagine it's not doing it any good i'll tell you the reason i wouldn't eat it and then it's open to interpretation main reason is that once you freeze something you change the, the nature of it and the structure and then you, once you thaw it out, you know, when people say, oh, don't eat raw meat, you'll get, you know, bad bacteria or parasites or whatever. That can only exist once it's been denatured. So yeah. if it's being cooked or if it's being frozen and then you leave it out, that's when you get things like food poisoning. Uh, hmm. I just personally wouldn't do it. I think that it's, if I've had something frozen, if meat has been frozen, I don't see any point in eating it raw. May as well cook it. First of all, because you will actually get rid of any bad, anything in there that could be harmful, but also because it's already denatured. So you may as well cook it and have like some hot sauce with it or something. Uh, flash frozen though, it's a good question. I don't know the answer because I don't know, does it freeze it to its core or is it just a flash freezing? It's almost like cooking something blue. You know how you might just like sear some meat. You haven't really cooked the meat. You've cooked the outside. Mm. but the middle is still fresh so does flash freezing freeze the whole thing at a really cold temp to its core or does it just kind of like you know what i mean is yeah. it like a cryovac thing i don't know what what his process is but because i did talk to the actual farmer and i wanted to talk to him and because and so i was like so is it flash freezing and he's like yeah i'd say that i mean it's pretty quick and i mean with the at least with the liver they're sliced thin so flash freezing something thin like that and i do know uh, another guy that gets uh his meat from there and he eats those raw too so but okay. yeah i it's it sucks though because i like that's my best local option and yeah. it just everybody does it because same with like if i go to the buffalo shop they sell you know awesome you know all natural buffalo meat it, mm -hmm. like they only have freezers they only do frozen right. that's what that's just what they do and you know i did ask the farm i said can you know can i get this stuff from you 
but having never been frozen, he's like, oh, no one's ever asked that. I mean, I take it to the butcher and that's how it comes back. He's like, probably, but you got to let me know way in advance and you got to tell me what, you know, what all you need. And yeah, so it's a little that's bit. That's fine. I would, I would do that. Look, I think in the, in the short term, the way you're describing the process, I don't think you got anything to worry about. I think mm. it's better than not having it. However, I would definitely be trying to source, not trying to, I would definitely be sourcing, getting it raw, which means getting it enough notice in advance for them to be able to provide that. The other thing that I've been suggesting to people is especially around, you know, places where I know where you live, there's a lot of people that hunt, you know, and there's even yeah. clubs. So what you could do is you could join clubs and a lot of them just like the, the part of hunting and they like the meat. Most people go after muscle meat and they're not really like my housemate. He's a really keen fisherman. Never, ever keeps livers, eyes, anything like that. Throws them out mm -hmm. like they're junk. And so, uh, you know, most people are just after the flesh. So if you joined a club, you could even say, hey, I'll slip someone a bit of money or can I come hunting with you? Or when you bring it back, just so that you use all of the animal, can I come and I'll help you clean the animal or something and I'll take a couple of parts, you know, like a bit of the liver and maybe some bone or something like that. You know, a lot of that stuff is way more valuable than the meat, which is what a lot of people at hunt want to take or they want the skins or something to make clothing or rugs or whatever. Yeah. So that's another option is to join various groups, either on Facebook or actual, like they've got their own website, they're a proper hunting club or whatever. And I would get in with people like that because you're going to be able to get then a supply of fresh stuff because it's not a commercial venture. Yeah. Therefore they don't have to flash freeze things as part of, you know, keeping them safe. <laughs> yeah. That's, them. that's how I found this. I mean, we started, um, somebody invited me to a Thursday night freedom group for the county and it's just nobody I know. And it's, everybody's awesome. So, it, it, and everybody's already starting to trade and work with stuff. I mean, nice. it's great. I mean, you have the drawbacks of this whole scamdemic, but this is like, we wouldn't have been doing that had, you know, we just continued on with life yeah. as usual. Right. So I, unfortunately I have to find that when I move, but I already know a, a quite a few people down there and it's in a bunch of farmland i'm sure i can find it but um what was i gonna say oh yeah but what you were saying with the so i talked to this this farmer his name scooter and he was like because i asked him about the liver he didn't have any the day i was there he's like well i you know i'm getting some back from the butcher on sunday and i'll have it then he's like but it's funny that you asked that because he's like i used to i couldn't I couldn't sell that. I would have to give it away. And I'd always have plenty to throw away two years ago. So now, I mean, it always sells out always. He's yeah. selling it. Every, you know, he gets rid of that, you know, weeks before he gets his next cow done. So um, a lot of people are catching on to that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, same when I used to go to the butcher on the, where I used to live like five, 10 years ago, uh, they, they couldn't give away bones. And then people became aware of things like bone broth and why it's mm -hmm. good for you. And then all of a sudden bones are no longer free or they're being chucked out, used as dog food. They start to go up, they, they, now they're selling them and then they go up in price and then you have to pre-order. Otherwise they they all gone on the day they're available. Like, oh, yeah. it's funny how people, you know, they go through phases of what they realize is food and nutritious and what they're willing to do. So it's the same all over the place. Yeah, and it's crazy. It's like thrown away, and now it's like, no, now people are paying extra for it. And yeah, yeah, I asked him yeah. about the chicken feet too, because he has organic raised chickens, and they're awesome. And I just ate one of the chickens for the first time the other day, and it was amazing. I haven't really mm -hmm. been eating that much meat because I haven't had a good source of it. You get get this. My local grocery store does have grass fed beef, it, um, but uh, if you look at the sticker, it says product of Australia. And that's, really? that can't be good, me eating Australian beef. So yeah. the two times that I, I have tried it, it tasted good, but it, it really made me feel like it made me feel like my whole body was like changing pH or energy or something. It just did not right. feel good. Yeah. So yeah, I've only, I haven't been eating that much. Eating, I haven't eaten chicken in like six months to a year. And so that was the first chicken. That was really good. But I asked him about the feet and he was like, well, he's like, I used to sell them. I used to do this with them, but now I just throw them away. It's like, you just let me know next time I bring a batch over there and 
yeah, you can have the chicken feet because I know, you know, Dr. Kaufman talks about chicken foot soup all the time. So I wanted to try that. Yeah, there's so much collagen in the chicken feet. That's the other thing that used to be people and then people buying bags of them. (laughs) Yeah, You have to order them now from butchers around here because people know that you can make broth from them. And they're very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully down where uh, um, we're moving, there'll be plenty of people like that because it's it's odd because where, where I live now is out in the mountains and it's more rural um, than where we're moving. It's still going to be like 45 minutes to an hour from Philly. So it's like considered suburbs, but it's just as rural. Like there's just as much land. It's just like these are the suburbanites. But the neighborhood where I was looking at, I mean, everybody's like doing stuff in the yard, got chickens, got four wheelers. And this is like a neighborhood. And then meanwhile, like here, like it's like it's weird, really. uh, Yeah, liberal kind of everybody watches their TV and just goes along. There's no there's no local farms doing stuff that I can find. That's what I mean. It took me months to find that local farmer and he's an hour away. So. Yeah, so hopefully it, it'll be it'll be good moving down there and we can find that. Yeah, and obviously more people when you say local farmer as in one, what happens what happens if something happens to that guy? I think it's really important for people to realize that if you've started to get into the more natural way and you've started to look for natural local sources and you realize it's like one guy with doing the milk or one guy doing a certain crop, it's like that's not good. Mm Because one thing happens to that property, one wrong storm, you know, one illness in that family, that whole supply is gone. So we need to be able to, you know, when we're thinking about what's coming in the future, and it will get a bit weird in the future (laughs) before it gets, uh, you find its feet again, uh, that's a concern. So right. that means people need to be learning these skills for themselves, uh, finding yeah, who can take over or different places. If, if that land for some reason couldn't be used, where can, what other land can be used even for that one guy? Right. And more importantly, other people learning that skill. Yeah, no, we're talking about getting, you know, the new roommates getting chickens and maybe rabbits and stuff. And yeah, definitely more people because like I said, it's the one farmer and even he like he's never you know he's just a community guy he doesn't like he said i thought about getting the organic sticker but they wanted me to sell in a co-op and do all this stuff and i'm like i'm not doing that and so he's like you know just come talk to me but yeah they're organic as i mean he didn't say that these they're just as good if not better than whatever would have that sticker on it yeah um but i and and i haven't even found any place where i can get raw milk any good place so there's one and it's a factory farm and i've i got it for a little bit but i can just taste the bad energy the pus and the milk and and there's nothing like i went to the farm it's nothing there's nothing that stands out as natural or good about it other than they're they sell it raw some you know to people yeah and so i stopped getting that so we need to find some of those um sure. and certain somebody on tv i won't mention his name but works for a certain u.s corporation wants to ban beef though is like talking about that on tv and that's you know i talked to the farmer about it and i was like what you guys don't care about that you just do black market beef right but that's really what they're talking about is banning this crap and you know i don't want to get into the talking the politics but yeah we need to figure out how we the like every single aspect of your life you need to figure out how to detach it from anything that makes any difference with the u.s you know corporation or any of those corporations it needs to be Mm -hmm. your community we don't care what they did over there yeah so totally we're working on that and that's that's why i'm doing this move because it's it's a way bigger yard and a lot more stuff to do and a lot more people around that i know so we're doing that and uh also going to cut down on some expenses so we don't even have to worry about making that much money we can make our community and if it makes money sure but you know i i'm like you or trying to be like you're not really just moving away from the need from having to use that currency crap so Mm -hmm. oh i'm trying to be more like me as well i'm not there yet (laughs) yeah (laughs) well yeah not not there definitely but it's yeah look there's um I talk a lot about that and 
one of the things I'm trying to get people to get an understanding of is more the way that it's structured. It's not necessarily to move right away from it. I mean, moving away from it to a degree is good, but just think of it this way. If you move out of having money altogether and then the people that run everything have all of the money, that doesn't really help. Mm. And neither does it help is if, if you need something that somebody else can't provide without money. You know, like you need some machinery, you need something to get your moneyless system out of some trouble. It's going to require money. And it's harder to barter with people that are just money oriented. So it's more the the grip that it has on people and the way it's used. Uh, I think that's more what I'm trying to get across to people. I mean, me personally, hey, that's my journey. I'm still trying to get just away from it pretty much completely. Still use it to a degree, but definitely be doing more trades, bartering and being very, very self-sufficient. And once I got to that stage, though, you need to maintain it. That's the other thing. I think people have a utopian view about what it would be like to be self-sufficient. It's a lot, it's lifelong work. There's no retirement. There's no, you know, you can't just kick your feet up at the end of some period of time and, and it looks after itself because it doesn't. That's mm. a, that's a trap that the system has put into our minds that we can just stop working at some stage. And yeah. so if you want to go self-sufficient, realize that it is day in, day out, lifelong work. And if anything goes on toward with that and you have to start again, then the question is, can you start that again without money? You might get it going, but like I said, the wrong weather pattern and the weather's being manipulated to a high degree at the moment, the wrong weather pattern, uh, the wrong group of people come through the town who are starving and decide they want your stuff, uh, the wrong anything. You know, we, we don't really know. You've just got to keep in mind that it's not a good idea to close off to burn all bridges. And oh, yeah. when I talk about money, I talk about the way that it enslaves people's mind, their soul, their energy. Where does their energy go as a result of being so consumed by money and basing their own value on money? And then also uh, how much of them is kind of like chasing it? How much are you borrowing money? Which is, you know, it is completely perpetuating that the current system and what that leeches from, which is the earth itself. So as I say, it's like, it's more complicated than just trying to say, I'm trying to get out of just having money altogether. It's the, I'm, I can't foresee a future in the short term where I won't be using it at all. Uh, yeah. I can't see that yet. No, yeah, I, but, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's not a utopian like, oh, we have no money here. It's more about like, uh, you know, when you get that kind of stressful feeling like, oh, I'm going on this trip and am I, am I get, you know, am I going to have enough to pay these four bills whenever I get back? And it, and that like perpetual stress of like, well, actually, I need to have eight times my living expenses saved for X, Y and Z. And I don't have that. And, and I feel inadequate and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about moving completely outside of it because you're right you you do need it and 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 that's fine i don't think there's anything inherently evil about using a uh, uh you know money of exchange or is you know like a gold and silver that you that people can't manipulate you know unlike the paper money which is you know it's backwards anyways you're trading debt so, yeah. and it's extremely manipulated. I mean, they printed what, like 40% of the currency who just came in the last year. It's insane. And I mean, that, that's, that's literal rape. If you own your body, right? And you own your work and you go do work and they trade it for money of account. And then that money of account gets devalued or degraded by, or yeah, just, devalued degraded by 20 percent like they've stolen your energy from you and so that's mm -hmm. why too like you know i'm not i'm not against like using stuff like that gold and silver and if i need to convert it into cash to get things and i agree because you might need a tractor you might need this and that um it's more about like yeah we'll build some things and and do some homeschool stuff and do a lot of trading. But if we need to, you know, I'm going to, you know, sell this handmade table to so-and-so kind of stuff like that. And, and I do have, you know, I do have like modern stuff that I work on. I'm helping somebody uh, with their, you know, normal people business <laughs> too, to get cash. But it's, it's more about moving away from that uh, feeling all the time that everybody has I mean, not everybody, but most people have in the modern world of like, well, you don't have a job. What are you going to do? 
you don't do this. What are you going to do? And why aren't you stressed out? I mean, I hear people talking about they don't want to retire early because that's $300 less a month for six months. And it's like, isn't your time worth more than that? Like, if you need $300, can't you just do something? Like, why not just retire? And actually, I think they will be retiring, the, you know, the person I'm talking about, but it's that kind of stress and control. I mean, it's just the control it has over your life and what you do. I just, I don't want that to have any influence on what I do with my life, basically. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So. It, that's the thing is the control because the, it, it is the energy, like you say, the energy doesn't just go nowhere. And that's what they're tapping into. That's the whole reason for money. It's not so we can have security and buy things and have freedom and whatever. It's literally to control. And the energy is what's being controlled. Mm -hmm. So that's when I talk about it, I'm more talking about that aspect and how to move away from having your energy leached as a result of money in general. Once you can get around that and master that, then it's not as much of an issue. But also you won't generally be buying into the same way of using money that most people use it once you've understood and felt that yeah and it's good to remember so and i hear people talking about this and to distinguish the difference between um what you're talking about so that's what's being degraded is the currency and you're right it's the energy it's the current you know in the banks of the river the banks make sure the current is moving the way it's supposed to be moving um, and that's more what U.S. dollars is, whether it's a negative or a positive and negative, I mean, like a debt owed or, or a liability or an asset, they make sure the current's moving and that's what, what is manipulated. And so kind of making sure you distinguish like money, really, you know, there's a lot of like gold and silver people that like currency is not money. Current money is something hard, gold or silver that you can do. And I mean, there's people that take that to the courts and they set down money. I'm not a pauper. Here's gold and silver. Mm. So I think it's important that, you know, when you have that conversation, make sure we distinguish those two because there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, gold and silver money or any money, you know, uh, food, money, anything that you're really just, you're exchanging your energy for somebody else's energy, right? That's right. So, yep. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I was like. Only real is real, right? I mean, I had some Bitcoin and I, I converted into something real and I, it, you know, I did well off of it. But yeah, yeah, I caution people very greatly because that's, I mean, so you're with that, you're putting more energy and it's going into a, so like the people's energy that get it. And then also the energy it takes to process it, you know, it takes like a, the amount of you know a, a small country in europe to process it so that's all that energy in our real world going into not our real world and for what so yeah exactly definitely just talk about that anyway tom um i how much time do you do you have do you need to get going uh about another 20 minutes okay so we could talk about um how do you feel about talking about the the visualizations and and you know bring in your mental mental your mentalism into the into the physical world keen sure all right so yeah, well that's kind of <laughs> that's a big one it might but be that's a long one of, yeah but that's that's what everything is everything is a representational manifestation of the psyche it's kind mm -hmm. it's the basis of where everything is projected from so it creates the physical and then we essentially pull to us the events that the deep psyche needs to experience or on an on an unconscious level is is asking for pulling into itself so that's why what we experience is never an accident what we experience in the world is essentially what we're asking for on a fundamental level below the ego. So not, I want this, or I don't want that. I want seven Lamborghinis. I'm going to manifest seven Lamborghinis. That's not where it comes from. Uh, nor is it, I don't want bad things to happen to me. That's not manifesting either. It's coming from the deep level of the psyche, right on that borderline between where we become the part of ourself and it borders on the part that's not us that's the, the everything that's where it comes from and so 
that leads to our essentially our thoughts and our mind and uh, the body of the mind and uh, and that's where everything how we experience firstly the world that we see around us because we're really experiencing ourselves, the world around us like that inversion of things and uh yeah i mean where did you want to go with i mean that's the basis of it but where did you want to go with it so i want to start with a, a short story and two examples or not not two examples a short story and then um, so I ride BMX. Um, I know you surf, right? Mm-hmm. So there's very, they're very similar. So I ride BMX. I, I never was like pro or anything, but I've been doing it for 20 years and, you know, I've gone to Barcelona to ride. I've, I've done a lot, um, uh, been around pros. I kind of just really never liked to the stress of like adding that to riding. I, I ride for fun. So not super yeah. i don't want to stress i want it to be just like the inner battle with me and and bringing stuff to real life anyways that's part of that so the story um and i mean it took years for the meaning of this story to fully like settle in my head so uh i was in barcelona and this was the first time i went there and i uh and it's not a bad thing. I, I, it's so it's really hard to describe. So Russians, I, I made a really good Russian friend there. And not all Russians, but some Russians have this mindset that's just, it, I don't know, you can't really compare it to any anybody else that I've ever met. Um, that it Like crazy isn't the right word. I mean, he's just very strong and pointed. Anyway, so we'll tell you this. <laughs> He, I was talking to him and, and we were riding a bunch of spots in Barcelona. So, you know, you meet up with people and then you go and you ride certain spots and then you go eat and you drink and whatever. Um, so I rode with him probably every day I was there and he's really, really good. And he always had people filming him. I'd filmed a couple clips for him. Anyways, he's really good. Uh, so I'm talking to him, trying to get, get to know him. I think we're eating lunch or something. And he told me, he was like, yeah, but he's like riding in Russia sucks. He's like, I only really ride like two, two months out of the year tops. And the rest of the year, I just work. I was like, you ride two months out of the year. I was like, how are you so good? Cause he's like, it's just insanely good. Like could be pro if he wanted to. Um, and he goes, well, He's like, I just think about it in my head and then I do it. And I, he's like, I just practice it. He's like those, the, the months of the winter, he's like, I just practice in my head, like over and over and over. And so I'm thinking, I mean, when I, I wasn't in the right time of my life to really hear that and learn from it. But like, as I've grown, like I've thought about that more and more and like, I can literally think in my head. So like there's two, two aspects to learning something on BMX is one is kind of just like getting the feel for something because like you, Tom, I, I don't think you ride BMX. If you were to like drop in and go for a big jump, like all those feelings would be really new to you. And you couldn't just like, I mean, maybe you could, but it's a lot more mental power to just visualize yourself over a, you know, 12 foot jump, having never done any of that ever before. So it's kind of like, it's getting used to the feeling of taking something mental and then bringing it into the physical realm, like through your body in a very precise way, working with, you know, physics and all of that kind of stuff too. Um, so part of it is legit, literally getting your body used to that feeling. So like you'll be used to doing a spin to the left and you get, you kind of feel that out. So then when the second part comes when you're trying to learn new things or perfect something like you can think about it and be like, well, I didn't pull up right at the right spot and my knees were really stiff and I needed to have this elbow looser. So then that's like the fine tuning of it and like the actual learning. But once you get to a certain level, like, you know, even if you've not done that trick before, like a rail, you know what that's going to feel like, even though you've not done that one. And so you have to, so the other part is then in your mind if you so with bmx like a rail is the perfect thing so like if you can't see yourself hopping up onto that rail sliding all the way down it and landing 
very clearly guaranteed you will never ever land it like you if you're going to try something you have to be able to see yourself landing it or you won't land it so there's a a couple things like you could work your way up to it but you can't work your way up to a rail like you have to jump and commit all the way down like yeah. that's it if you don't you're yeah. done so yeah. I, I don't know i've just learned a lot uh, through bmx on stuff like that like you it is about seeing yourself in your mind doing something and then you really have to have your body like loose enough and and control enough of your body and then to like commit all the way and follow through rather than like some people will be like whoop and then like freeze in the middle of the air and then you know, you're tumbling down the stair it sucks so mm -hmm. um that's about that's the mentalism i wanted to talk about i figure since you surf i mean it's the same thing right you can you have to visualize yeah. yourself doing it um yeah there's a there's definitely a few aspects to that um i think a lot of people are familiar with those studies that were done through various universities where uh one group of people just did no practice another group of people actually you know were throwing shots and from the three-point line or whatever and then other people didn't practice but just visually just went over doing those drills and they performed extremely well just from the visualization wow. i think one of the elements of it is needing to feel it in the body so i can visualize visualize myself going going down like dropping into a ramp or doing a 12 foot jump i can visualize it but because I have no experience of that. You're right. You know, I haven't, I mean, other than a kid doing jumps, you know, but I'm not never done a 12 foot like uh, clearance or a ramp or anything like that. So uh, yeah, I can't feel it in my body. I can visualize it, but it's like me. It's like a dream. I can't feel it in my body. I think the part of it that needs to be met is being able to feel it. Like you were describing how do my knees feel on my arm, my elbow there. What's it feeling like? Like, how am I reacting? When you can feel it in your body, then your body doesn't actually know the difference between it actually happening and you imagining it. That's mm -hmm. the difference. It's being able to, to um, get some kind of sensory experience of it. So surfing's the same. And the thing though that is extremely important with it is if you're present, if you're in the zone and present, you're basically just figuring things out in real time, but it's all being fed from somewhere else. As soon as you go out of that and you're like, oh no, what happens if or did I do this right? And you'd come out of the moment. That's when you can have, yep, that's when you're gone. <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a lot of things. It's a lot of things at once. Uh, but that whole thing of being present and in the zone is one of the, that's why people love, like you said, you want to just be in BMX for the experience, for the creativity, for the joy. Same with like, you know, a lot of people get into a sport or they play music or something and they just go, no, I never want to, I never want to do that as a job because I don't want to come out of that pure sense of what I'm doing and wreck it with, you know, the other side, which adds stress and which takes you out of the pure, the purity of it. And a lot of the reasons we do these, like people used to ask me why I used to enjoy fighting. It's mm -hmm. not because I was angry. I never wanted to hurt anybody in boxing or wrestling or karate or anything like that. I was never about hurting anyone. It was about what you said before, I mean, it was that, you, you're finding something really deep within yourself and you're expressing and you're in a moment, you're in a complete zone. So when you've just got this battle between you and one other in, in a combat sport, for example, it's like everything else falls away. There's nothing but this. And it's meditative, it's spiritual, it's everything other than violence. The violence is not a part of it at all. And the same with BMX, it's not necessarily about or surfing or anything. It's not about being extreme. And oh, I'm doing something extreme and I'm cool and I can tell people about it later I feel tough for doing it or whatever. It's like you are, you are reaching a point that other people have never even dreamt of yet. There's just, right. they haven't even considered it as part of their being or their mind or a higher part of them. But you access that part of you by engaging in these activities and pushing in those ways to, to find something much deeper in yourself. And you would, I'm sure you'd agree, that's what it's, that's the essence of it all. And you, uh, other people can't understand why you might want to throw yourself down a 20 stair or do a rail. But like you said, you have to fully commit to that. Same with surfing. You can't half-ass something. You can't try to take off on a really vertical big wave and just go, I'll see if this works or I might give it a go. So like if, when, if you're not 100% committed with every fiber of your being to making that, 
to like land same with skateboarding you know like you've, if you're going to do a rail you've got to be doing the rail you can't just like be tr- yeah i'll sort of do it yeah <laughs> you can't that's when and, you're going to get messed up yeah that's exactly and when you are fully committed it's like anything in life a lot of the times things don't just appear for you you have to take a leap of faith sometimes but be fully committed to that decision as sometimes you're on like a, a ledge and there's you can't see anything it's black and so you're like oh well i'm not going to go anywhere because i don't know the next step you know it might be like a business move or a, or a relationship or anything in your life and mm-hmm. so but if you just go no i i i know i've i can i've it's not like a rash decision. It's just something like, like I feel this, so I can do it. I can felt it in my body. And now you go and fully commit to it. As you take that step, something appears under your foot to land there. You know what I mean? That's like, that's where that leap of faith. That's where the faith comes in. And it's mm-hmm. the same as committing to a trick in skating, BMX, surfing, whatever. If you fully commit to it with every fiber of your being, that's when you'll stick it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you if you're not there if you don't really believe it you know then then it'll show up <laughs> and the consequences are much the stakes are higher yeah in that kind of situation yeah but i was gonna say go so it's it's like uh it's not similar to real life it's exactly the same as real life except maybe yeah. it's a little bit faster faster pace but yeah. that that's what you said not everybody's had that experience and i mean it, it is like a full meditative thing because you can like that's why, I mean, I say sometimes, you know, it's like saved my life because it's just like, you can't be upset or depressed if you're making yourself do something like that. Like you can't be set. You can't be thinking about, you know, breakup or something yet you're riding like, and that's it. That's all you're doing. You're skating, you're surfing. So it's a beautiful thing to learn. And it taught me a lot about life, but, it, and then you find out this is exactly how everything is because like what you were saying you create it all in your mind and then you bring it out into the real world and and so having that experience um and uh, through bmx of like like i know that if i don't commit i'm gonna crash this like so why even try it if you're not gonna commit and so it's always been the same for life wise too like you know you're gonna fail at starting your business unless you commit i mean i mean i've heard people say this i mean i would agree but i've heard quite a few people say like you know if you really want to get your own business started you have to commit as in you can't have a backup you can't have an out after that you need to be like i'm going to succeed and quit like yep and it, it is that same thing it just it's on a slower scale right in, in real life you know you have to commit to what you're doing and you have to be present there and say yeah it's just a beautiful beautiful lesson it is I've, yeah i've heard many of the uh, people that are still on like some sort of government support while they start a business or something it's like the day that they just go not nah, cutting myself off from that they never worried about money again while it was there they were always worried and it was ho- holding them back but realistically i think it all comes down to the responsibility in health in like law, like learning about that in spirituality, it's all about becoming completely self responsible. And that's what people don't get about, you know, what they think you just, oh, you just got a hobby. You're just out like riding your bike or out surfing, wasting time. But those people don't understand the degree to which you are touching something much greater and higher because it's literally all about self responsibility. If you're out halfway out in the ocean, no one's, no one's responsible for you making it back in but you. You know, you have to read the elements. You have to know your own abilities and you have to have faith in everything. And it's you, there's nothing else. There's no, like nothing else is coming to save you. Same as if you're like, you've taken off midair on your bike. Nothing is bringing you back and landing that or bringing it, making it safe, except you. It's, it's literally full responsibility, which is literally being fully alive. And that is why people that experience that, are the people that aren't so worried about what's coming. We know it's going to get weird in the world, but we're actually not as worried as other people who definitely have not done anything to experience what some people refer to as touching the void, which is where you've gone so deep within yourself and to touch such a greater part of existence that you don't worry about what comes because you know that you can take full responsibility for yourself and stick something. Mm -hmm. and you've experienced it every time you land a trick every time you take off 
on like a, a monster wave and, and not, you know, like every time you've tested yourself and you've put yourself in that position, you've, you've visualized it, but you've got faith. It's part of the skill you've worked up. It's everything combined, but it's full responsibility at the end of the day. And that's why people like us aren't afraid of, you know, what's coming because we can even visualize how it's going to be. And we know that that's going to ha- help us through, for example, you know, it's, yeah. uh, we, is that the same for you? You feel that having done and had those experiences that other people haven't had, like when I used to get up at 4.30 in the morning and train mm-hmm. every morning, it's like the rest of the day is easy after that. You've done things that other people aren't even thinking of doing or haven't imagined. So the rest of the day is easy. It's like stress, what stress? Why would I be overwhelmed? I've already done more than, you know, like before I've even had breakfast, I've done more than most people are going to do in their lifetime. You know, it's kind of right. not to that degree, but it's yeah. like, that's why you don't get overwhelmed. And same with these, these kinds of activities. Do you feel the same as far as the weirdness that I guess the world is going to see? Do you feel that you're better equipped to deal with that mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, because of things like BMX and visualizing? Yeah. I mean, I don't, no, because I'm not other people, but it seems like I would be. And, and I have a, here, so here's it for people who haven't experienced BMX surfing, anything like that. Here is another good story that, uh, but it's the same, same thing, right? So, um, I like to go on hikes at the end of the night and I live like on a country road and I can walk, you know, it's a gravel road. I walk down and then like the road ends and then it's a trail and it just goes up to throughout the game lands and there's a waterfall and stuff, but doing that at the end of the night. So pretty much by the time I get to the waterfall, it's almost all the way dark. And, um, eyes is another thing I wanted to talk to you about, but what I've been doing more, uh, at the end or even throughout is, you know, I have, I'm nearsighted. So like everything far is blurry. And so what I've been doing is, is trying to think, well, what if actually this is how I'm supposed to see, I mean, even if that's not right, it's at least a good exercise to be like, you know, what am I missing here? Because actually like the, the branches of the trees, they look, I don't know. It's really hard to explain how light and everything looks when you're not, you don't have good vision and it's just, anyways, it's just a good exercise, but I always like would be walking down the trail and I like have my glasses like right here and like I want to all right like I want to put them back on what is that down there uh yeah. or like so when I get back to like I live on a it's a horse ranch I mean I don't have any horses I just rent a house but the people who own the houses they own horse ranch and they do stables and stuff so there's always like the people whose horses they are are, are around and there's stuff happening and you have to talk to neighbors and stuff so like, I, I would think like, oh, I got to put on my glasses. So like, if a neighbor is coming up, then I can see them and I can see who it is. And then I can, you know, say hi, or, you know, maybe it's the landlord, then I got to be different. And then I'm thinking, I'm like, wait a second. Why in the world do I need to put my glasses on so I can see them 500 feet away or whatever, when you're not going to be able to talk to them that far away. And they are probably not even going to acknowledge that they see you because most people don't. And they're probably just going to go off and do their own thing. And then even if they wanted to talk to me, like it would be when they're like 20, 10 feet away, 20 feet away when you can hear each other and see each other. And by that time, I'll be able to see them. So like, what am I being anxious about that? I need to like carry my glasses on and be ready at all times to like see somebody come up to me. Right. Nobody's going to try and kill me over here, hopefully. So that, that, you know, that's off the table. So it's just people like neighbors, like, and again, like you don't need to know, like whatever's going to happen, you'll be able to respond to it perfectly the same as if you were able to see it. So uh, I guess my point is like, you might not know exactly what's going to happen, but as long as you're living the way that you know you should be, you'll be able to respond to it just as good as if you had seen it coming. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. Like, like that's why people like, you know, talk about propaganda or misinformation. I think this guy's controlled opposition. And it's like, if you know the, the principles of something, like when you talk about the offer and acceptance, you know, such and such, like if somebody's there and they're in controlled opposition and blah, 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 like it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, you're doing what's right. Like I'm doing, you know, living on the land and trying and, and, and moving away from the commercial system. It's just like, I'm doing 
what I know is right. So it doesn't really matter if so-and-so was full of crap, right? I know what I'm doing is right. And it's the yeah. same thing with your eyes and be able to see what's coming to you. Totally. Yep. Totally agree. Yeah. It's, um, and you were totally in control of that, that type of environment too. So it's literally working with what you've got, you know, you, a skill you might want to develop. I've glimpsed it. I'm by no means a master of it. I don't know if I ever will be, but I've glimpsed it, which is remote viewing. It's mm. like, you can see, even if you had your eyes closed, you can actually see what's going on and you can do it through somebody else. Uh, mm. I've just had that experience of being able to see what somebody else was seeing despite them being in another city and going, oh, it's over there. You know, for some reason I glimpsed it and then it was gone. I'm like, oh, holy crap. Like I was, how do I get back to that? Never got back there. <laughs> so yeah. it's, a, it's a thing where you could actually remote view yourself. And even without having eyesight, you could actually walk your way through a wooded forest or something and not trip over anything, not hit your head. Uh, yeah, like yeah. that documentary, The Matrix, right? Yeah. <laughs> At the end, you could... <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Like uh, I've not gone full on, but I, I don't know. I feel like I've experienced enough to know like i know like you could do that i just haven't gotten around to figuring out you know and feeling yeah, through that and and making my way through it but yeah i you come to realizations like that like you know like if you let go and then you wait but then you know when things are coming right you know that there's somebody yeah. there you know that yeah, yeah. that's right Absolutely. you feel it yeah yeah it ent it enters into your like field for want of a better word you just yeah and and when you yeah so another thing is like you look up at the at the stars so like i can't you know stars look completely different when i have my glasses on versus when i don't um and i've done this with the glasses on and with the glasses off but you can look up at the stars and then you can just not very not long enough to like burn the light into the back of your eyes or whatever happens but just a brief look and then you can close your eyes and if you've if there's like the brighter stars have enough distance between them like you can see the stars like you can see the energy of the stars just by i mean just i mean you can see the energy of the stars it doesn't matter if your eyes are closed it may be you know your pineal gland that sees it but and and with the glasses off with them on the energy is still there and it's still in the same clarity so that's i guess maybe that's might not be the actual eyes then right because it doesn't the glasses don't change that energy that i could see and yeah. you start looking at stuff like this and last time i was on the plane i saw the same thing like you really just have to let go and let your be oh, because you know it's like what do you know what's there that you're not seeing already it could, I mean, there's tons of stuff there so mm -hmm. you have to let go and then you don't even know what it looks like because you can't describe it so you have to find new things and that you know those are the newer things that i found is you know seeing the energy of the stars like even with your eyes closed and then you can move and you can see that energy stays there it's wild so something yeah. for people to try <laughs> yeah but in the plane and i saw looking down at the blue like with my glasses off i could see little flyers of energy you know it was patterned but it was like energy in the blue sky and you know glasses on glasses off didn't make a difference and it wasn't in my eyes because like i turned my head and it's still over there mm -hmm. stuff like that you can so maybe not quite remote viewing but i think those few experiences and also like definitely like if you've known you've had intuition that's been just like spot on, but like, you know, an hour early or a minute early, then, you know, like that's, so that's remote viewing too. I mean, that's, you're connecting into the information of all of nature. Right. So I know it's there. I, I've never done it. I've never seen it like you're talking about yet, but anybody wants to do it teach yourself yeah it's there all the yeah. all these capabilities are within us you know we just got to find them so it's uh yeah easier said than done but it's definitely there it just mm -hmm. even just knowing it's there and even visualizing it i guess mate i haven't tried that maybe visualizing doing more remote viewing is something that'll get you know get that back yeah and what tom 
you know, I've heard you say it. I think we've said it on one of our conversations that like the, the fake internet, the electrical internet is what we're on right now, but there's a real internet. That's, that's nature where you can know all knowledge. It's just, you need Mm -hmm. to know how to see it and how to, I don't know, uh, process through it for lack of better words. But Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's the same thing. It's, you know, that, the Akashic record or whatever is nature and our language. You can, you can deduce yeah. history looking through the language. So mm-hmm. it's, it's wild. That's anyway, right. yeah. have you um, just real quick before we finish up, I have you ever helped people work through like healing their eyesight as far as their vision? Cause I, I mean, I know there's exercises you can do and i've heard lots of people that can you know have worked through it and healed their eyesight if you do you have any experience with that yeah it just depends on what it's from though it depends on whether there's a a um structural issue where because of the compression of bone it's changed the shape of the eyeball if mm-hmm. that's the case it's hard it's much harder to do but if it's just the case of it's either adrenal health uh nutrient insufficiencies and then maybe just like topical applications on the eye can definitely do it combined with eye exercises that can definitely improve eyesight yeah um but when it's structural then and the actual shape of the eyes being changed because of the um compression of the the facial uh bones then it's uh not as successful in my experience but can definitely be done yeah yeah, I, I, I wish I could remember his name, a really sweet guy who, t- you know, talked about healing eyes and former eye doctor. Man, mm-hmm. I wish I could remember his name. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but he said, I mean, one, he, he came out of a, a long meditation and he opened his eyes and he could just see, but then he spent a lot of his life figuring out like, you know, cause most of the, you know, doctors and people who work in Western medicine are just there to keep their business going. And it's not about healing yeah. people. And the same as goes for eyes, um, that like just by putting on the glasses, they're usually like way too strong. And then they just weaken your eyes because it's mm-hmm. the muscles that change the shape of your eyes. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, most of them, not all of them, uh, the, I, uh, issues is like nearsighted and far or farsighted is from like stress and like the weakening of those muscles and then the slow change of the shape of the eye but you yeah you know from what people like he said you can you can change that back and i have a, a list of exercises i need to get more on those but mm-hmm. yeah i'm just curious from from the tom barnett's point of view if he uh yeah yeah it's I, doable so. yeah um and it's wild like looking at carrots and they say oh carrots are good for your eyes i mean you slice a carrot it looks like an eyeball yeah like so i mean the nature is just giving you the answer it's like right there all all over the place yeah uh, anyway tom um do you want to finish with anything before you you know i know you got to get going do you want to play some music i got a, I got a little african handmade drum right here <laughs> I don't know how it sounds through that mic but yeah you can't really jam on that i've tried that you can't do it on zoom or anything because it's uh, a delay <laughs> the mic's no good and you can't hear it while you're playing so i was like hey yeah. the mic. you had a, yeah, uh... no, nothing nothing to add man there's just uh i think a lot of people are starting to get a lot more on the right track and it's good to see so i think the more people are you know not just thinking about visualizing like we we're talking about their own path through life for their own future, the more realistic that becomes. So the, it's, it's quite heartening to see how many more people are actually on this path now of wanting to create their own different reality from what's put out in front of us in the matrix. And then, and we can absolutely do that. So uh, my only, my last bit is just to like encouragement that when you're on the right track like that, keep it up because it can only lead you to the right place. Yeah. Totally. And so many people just like snapping too lately and just like, Oh, we got to do all this stuff, the right, the right path and calmer yeah. too feels like, but I know a lot of people get, you know, real anxious seeing the other people, but you got to remember, it's like not about the others. It's just about you doing the right thing. Yep. So, totally. And your website's up. So Tom Barnett TV, uh, I checked that out for the first time looks good man i I really like it had somebody remark that it's pretty awesome that you just like do all that stuff for free and 
you have the chats like this. So, you know, good work, you. Thanks. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah I'm really happy with it. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. And it's going to be as safe as something can be on the internet <laughs> as far as not losing it all. Because I keep getting stuff deleted off. I'm banned for another seven days from Facebook. My YouTube's get videos deleted. So, yeah, everything's on there. Uh, including all the old videos. So yeah, people can go check that out. All the old stuff and some of the private stuff that people haven't seen, that's all up there. And uh, yeah, thanks. I'm glad you like it because I'm happy with it too. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, and yeah, the, so if anybody goes there, I think if I'm not mistaken, your uh, Can You Catch a Virus video is like right on the front yeah. page, like some of the older yeah, videos to kind of like catch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the first two ones that went around are uh, sticky to the top whatever you call it yeah on the first page yeah i just sent the that enough and, and your one where you talk about the this shedding issue that people are all freaking out about to a bunch of people because they're yeah you know stirring up fear and i'm like but i mean even if it was true like it's not helpful to stir up all that fear but you know so i sent exactly. him your videos and a nice little thing from dr kaufman and stuff so yeah definitely sure. worth good good stuff checking out all right tom we'll We'll have to do this another time. I'll stop the recording yep. real quick. Everybody, uh, 